like for you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter. And we'll begin in Genesis chapter four with verse one. And may God speak to all of our hearts. I'm dealing with this subject, the first child ever born. The first child ever born. When we're dealing with this chapter in the Bible, God reveals to us a portion of what he reveals to us all the way through the scriptures. That's the reason why we have the word of God. When you hold your Bible and look at it, there are 1,189 chapters, 66 books in the Bible. It is God's revelation of himself. We all know it's more than a table ornament. It is the very word of God. But why did God write it? And why did he design it this way? The word God says of itself, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And then he talks about how it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But it begins in that passage, as Paul writes to Timothy, with the way of salvation. And I want you to keep in mind while I'm preaching that the Bible is given to us to give us the unfolding story of God's redemption. He doesn't just get interested in you knowing about incidents and people. He wants you to know the way of salvation. He wants you to know that while you're on this earth, you can find the way to heaven and be born again. The Lord designed a certain order and the devil has done everything he possibly can and continues to do to disorder God's order. And this disorder now has become the new world order, but it's really the disorder of God's order. So no wonder you appear to sometimes people who who think you're off the wall with your ideas. They're so far removed for generations from the truth of God's word that you sound strange talking about this is what the Lord wants, this is God's design. We've made almost the full 180 degrees in some matters, especially with the family, redefining the family. We learn from the word of God that the family is the cornerstone for civilization. God meant for us to live in a world ordered his way with a family based his way. And now we've come to disorder God's way in the family and make it the new order for our world. So we need to return to the word of God and don't get the idea that you're just full of tradition and out of place, misinformed, some strange person with outdated ideas when you're just speaking the truth of God's word. This is the way it happened. Uh, this is more than some sort of story. This is the truth of the way it happened. In Genesis chapter four, beginning with verse one, God tells us, and Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this opening expression in verse one. I've gotten a man from the Lord. As a matter of fact, Eve is confusing Cain with Christ. God has told her he's going to send through the seed of a woman, the Savior. And we know that story of how finally the angels spake to Mary, this chosen virgin through whom God was to send his son into the world. But in Genesis chapter three in verse 15, we have the first promise of Christ as our Savior. 
And so quite naturally, Eve, excited as a mother, believes her son to be, in the language she uses, getting a man from the Lord, the Savior about whom God spoke to them. But he proves to be far, far from the Savior. I love the language God uses. He says, Adam knew his wife. This is with propriety the way God speaks about the relationship a man can have with his wife and she can become an expectant mother with that. All sense, it seems, of propriety has been removed from society today. And common language has become what was once considered vulgar. And I want you to think about that in your conversation with young people and in front of young people. A few years ago, expressions came out through the news about sexual behavior among the leading people in our country. And children had to ask questions about the most profane things that were things they should never have even been informed about except by their mothers and fathers in the privacy of their homes at the appropriate time. So God says that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Those of us who take the Bible literally believe that life begins with conception. And so there's life now. There's life in her womb. And the Bible says, and bear Cain, this is the first child ever born on earth. Can you imagine the marvel that Adam and Eve went through? When Adam knew his wife, she conceived. Never, never had anything ever happened like this. But God had so wonderfully designed her body, so wonderfully designed her body that she could bear a child and she could do what God gave them to do. Would you hold your place here just a moment and turn back with me earlier in the book of Genesis and what God says, if you look at it please, in chapter one and verse 28, the Bible says, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God gave them instruction immediately about why he created them and gave them this marvelous ability, a man and a woman, they were created male and female, to reproduce and replenish the earth. Two men can't do that by themselves and two women can't do that by themselves. God's design and God's order is for a man to marry a woman and that man and that woman can have a relationship together in the intimacy of their marriage and she can conceive and bear a child and this is what God is witnessing to here. Can you imagine when that child grew in her womb? That had never happened before. How marvelous and wonderful and miraculous she thought about that being. And then when the child was finally delivered and another human being for the first time, another human being came forth from Eve's womb. How happy she must have been. I'm sure they were like mothers and fathers since that time. They looked at his little toes and maybe they counted and saw they were just like the design God made for them, the perfect design. They're all there. Maybe they counted his little fingers and they looked at his thumb and saw it was like but smaller, their thumbs and their fingers like their fingers. They looked at the shape of his face. They noticed that 
He followed them with his eyes. He listened to them with his ears. I'm saying this has never happened before. This is the first child that's ever been born, ever. <laughs> and they looked at him. Amazing. And then she had another one. The Bible says in chapter four and verse two, and she again bears brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And the Bible goes on to tell us about them. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. God did not approve it. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. We're about to learn that this child who came from the same womb and has the same father as his brother Abel is capable of doing something that is unimaginable and unheard of. This first child that was ever born. And as we read on, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thou countenance fallen? Now why did God do that? And why did God put that in the Bible? Because he wants us to know that he created us to think, to respond. We're not robots wound up and programmed and have no will of our own. He created us with a conscience and with a will, with an ability to respond. He later says in the Bible to us, come now and let us reason together. Think about that. God created us with the ability to reason with him and to come around to the conclusion that his way is the right way and that's the way should be, we should be yielded to. So he speaks with Cain and he gives him in those questions an opportunity to respond. He didn't come and knock him in the head and said this is the way you're going to do it. He let him exercise his own will. This is the first child that was ever born. And now we see him responding. And the Bible goes on to tell the story. And the word of God says with this, with this wrath and fallen countenance, God says in verse seven, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, there's an accepted way. Remember that. Now, how would he have known? He's the first child ever born. How would he have known there's an accepted way? Because his mother and father told him. They tried the same stuff after sin. They sinned against God and brought the sin nature into the bloodstream of humanity. And when they sinned, they knew they were naked and they disobeyed God. And in their disobedience to God, they tried plants to cover themselves to atone for their sin, and it didn't work. And an innocent animal was slain, and the skins of that animal were used to cover them. This was the way God accepted the innocent, the innocent slain for the guilty. I said to you, there's a reason God gave the Bible and the one reason God gave the Bible is that everybody knows all through the Bible that the innocent was slain for the guilty. And all the things that point to Christ to tell us that the innocent Savior came into this world. He became a man without ceasing to be God and he was slain. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he was slaughtered. Like Adam and Eve slaughtered those animals to cover themselves. He was slaughtered. He went as a, a, a lamb to the slaughter. And there's no doubt that Adam and Eve taught this to their children. 
but he knew it. But the story continues. You could do what's accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. This is the first time sin is used in the Bible, the word sin. You might want to mark that. God says sin to make your own way, to choose not to obey God, literally to miss the mark, to come short, to do it your own way. Forget God and what God wants. But it's crouching at the door. At any moment, it can spring to its feet. It's a powerful thing. Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. They'd played together, grown up together, done everything together. Adam and Eve had enjoyed watching them just like parents would enjoy watching their children. They knew there was something different about Cain and his attitude. The Bible tells us what it is. You want to hold your place here? We'll interrupt for a moment and look somewhere else and come back if you'll hold your place. I want you to turn to the book of Jude, if you would, please. In the book of Jude, one chapter, one verse, God says in verse 11 of the little book of Jude, if you've gone to Revelation, you've gone too far. And in verse 11 of the book of Jude, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain, first child ever born, now this whole thing is identified with him the way of Cain. And one thing we know, the way of Cain is not the way of God. You're familiar with the way of Cain because you want to exercise your will over God's will from time to time. But here we're dealing with the matter of salvation. The way of Cain. One to them for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gang saying of Kor. I want to recommend to you that you learn well what the era of Balaam is and what the gang saying of Kor is. We've talked about that many times in the past, but you may have forgotten. Back to Genesis chapter 4. And Cain, verse 8, talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now, I want to say something to you. This is something he never intended to do in the beginning. At least that's my belief. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't bring to the Lord the thing God was dealing with him about, his envy toward his brother. Envy over what happened about their offerings. He would not bring it to God. He would not correct it in his life. And I want you to listen with your heart. When sin is not dealt with, it continues on its destructive path. And even you will be in shock, will be in shock at what you will do someday if you don't deal with it. So he became wroth, his countenance fell. God said, wait a minute, there's something wrong with you. You know if you do the way you've been taught, the way that's acceptable, it'll be accepted. Now here's your opportunity. You see, most people when reading this would think, well, you know, uh, Cain was a tiller of the ground Abel was a keeper of the sheep, so this is your reasoning. This is the way you reason. And by the way, this is the way I reason. It is the way all of us reason. It's the order we want to establish over God's order. And it's in all of us to do that. All of us. 
And so we get the idea, well, he brought his crops, so what? He's a tiller of the ground. And his brother brought his lamb because he's a shepherd. But what went wrong here had nothing to do with Cain being a tiller of the ground and Abel being a keeper of the sheep. It was not about their vocation. It was entirely a spiritual matter, entirely. Because God said, no doubt, we know the story. God said to their parents, Adam and Eve, that he would accept one way, the shedding of innocent blood. And Cain could have gotten a lamb, no doubt about it. God wouldn't have made that inaccessible to him. He could have gotten a lamb, but that wasn't it. He wanted his way. He didn't care what it cost. And he didn't care even if God didn't like it. He wanted his way. It's hard for you to sit and listen and me to stand here and speak to you and, and, and say that's in all of us, but it is in all of us and it must be dealt with. Can you imagine if you could have turned time back and looked at that first little baby when his mother Eve actually thought it was Christ, the deliverer, and have explained to them what's the capability in that child, what's the possibility of what he would do someday. She didn't understand fully, I think, what he did. He didn't reveal to them that he killed his brother. But she knew, she knew when she remembered what God said to her about the sorrow she would go through with children. She, God said to her, Eve, now you've sinned. You've sinned. I created you in a state of innocence and now you've brought sin into humanity. Do you have any idea the heartache and trouble that's ahead of you? And some of you parents, and you don't have to be parents. You look at your own life and you think, some of the things I've suffered because of my own way. Some of the things that my heart has had to feel the sorrow of because my children or I went my own way. You know what I'm talking about. It's not just the pain in giving birth that a woman goes through. It's the effects of the sin nature on our lives. And so we see this and now Lying on the ground is this precious man, the second son of Adam and Eve, and he's dead. He's dead. He'll speak because his life will witness, but his lips will not move. He won't walk through the gardens They'd already been banished from Eden because of their sin. But he's dead. And he's dead at the hands of his own brother because he wouldn't deal with envy toward his brother. And he wouldn't deal with the wrath, the wrath that he felt about this acceptance God made for Abel and wouldn't accept his way. Let me give you another verse if you'll hold your place here. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse four, the Bible says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You may wish just to write the reference. Hebrews eleven four. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. That's what God says about Abel. What Cain said about Abel. You're his brother, what do you say? I hate him. I hate 
hate him. I can't stand him. And I feel so strongly about it now, I'm going to kill him. Don't you have the same father, the same mother? But this thing has grown to a beast inside me because I've never held it in check, never confessed it to God, never gone God's way. You don't know yet what you're going to do in your sinful nature if you don't deal with it now. You say, Pastor, this is baby day. Did you forget that? No? No, I'm trying to tell you what your babies need. They need what you need, what I need. They need Jesus. When we continue to read this, you say, well, they just had different natures. They just, you know, one was high strung and the other passive. Oh, no, that's not what God says. After he slew him, and the Lord, verse nine, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? He's still giving Cain an opportunity to confess what he's done now. He can't be undone. And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? And the voice, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And he pronounces Cain's consequence which we don't have the time to go into, but it's horrible. He lives without peace. He can never really put his foot down. He's a vagabond, God says. He's gonna live the rest of his life in this unrepentant state. God carries it for five or six generations in the story in Genesis. And he's gonna die someday, having left this line of horror and terror. We, we can't find anything in it that's God honoring. He only needed one thing. He just needed to do one thing. He needed to say, not my will, but God's will. Not my way, but God's way. That's all. That's all. Why? Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Would you, would you like for me to answer this question? Who created Adam and Eve? Who created Eve and Adam to be able to bear children? Who gave Cain life? Is there not an ounce of gratitude? Is there no thought of the goodness of God? Hmm. Is it just all about him and no one else? This is the first baby ever born. Why in the world does God tell us this? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we all need redemption. All of us. And there's only one way of redemption. And that's coming to Jesus and accepting what he's done to pay our sin debt. Seeking him to be our savior and allowing him to indwell us and change us and give us the strength to overcome our old nature in life and have the victory in Christ. That's why, and you know what else God does? He goes through the whole Bible, all 66 books, all 1,100, we've only gotten to four of the chapters, all 1,189 chapters repeating this message to us over and over again that we need Jesus. You may have the cutest thing ever born, the most handsome little boy, the most gorgeous little girl, but he needs and she needs the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. That's without exception. Let's bow in prayer, may we?